Department and tight for the Agriculture Department. You can't have it both ways. And the President says that public enemy number one is inflation, and it is. It has gripped onto our economy and infested our economic system with a ferocity and a tenacity that no economist would have predicted 10 years ago. And if we don't begin to extricate ourselves from the grip of what is now double-digit inflation, then you can have all of the agricultural policies and all of the research programs and all of the buildings and all of the international harvester equipment, and we'll all be in a depression. Because runaway inflation, unchecked inflation, is an insidious disease that, if not controlled, ends in economic disaster. And every segment of the economy is going to have to participate in this fight if we're going to succeed on it. Labor is going to have to participate, business is going to have to participate, and the American farmer is going to have to participate. So when we start these hearings next year, and various groups will come in and say, improve this section of the appropriation, put more money in here, we're going to have to hear very patiently but we're going to have to say no to some very good and worthy ideas. We're probably going to have to say no to any capital spending program. We will not build one building, one lean-to, one research center, one lab, one anything, in my opinion. Zero dollars for capital investment because we want to save. And we're going to have to say some no to some very fine research grants that will have been presented by land-grant colleges or in the competitive grant program, but we're just going to have to say, not this year. We're trying to fight inflation. And thus, we all have a common destiny in that, ladies and gentlemen, and we all have to pay our fair share of the freight. And just as there is no free lunch in, in the world, there is going to be no segment of the American government that is going to be immune from the tight pressures of next year's budget. As we approach the season of Christmas and think in terms of the new year, we always think in terms of hope and anticipation and expectation. I think we can make some inroads in inflation if we pull together. I think we can make some inroads if we all say, okay, we've all got to tighten the belt a little bit and that we're all part of this because we're either all going to prosper together, or we're all going to go into what Mr. Kahn calls a big banana together. He can't call it a recession or a depression anymore. Those are nasty words. So I think there's more that unites us, and there's more in terms of our future economically that causes us to say that this year, and perhaps the year after that, inflation is public enemy number one and government policy at all levels, in all departments, has to focus on that as the factor that can bring us all to our economic needs. Good luck and Godspeed. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Friend of the American farmer, and a man that has contributed and will continue to contribute much to this great country of ours, Secretary of Agriculture, Bob Berglund. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Orrin Lee, members of the National Board, Delegates, fellow members, visitors, and friends all. I have an absolutely superb speech which has been written at my direction by professionals, copies of which I've given to the ladies and gentlemen here in the front row and which I shall not read. But I want to talk with you about farm power 
That means get organized. As Ornley has quite properly said, we are in a minority in this country. And some say that means that all is lost. Our problem is not that we're relatively few in number. Our problem is that we don't speak with one voice. We don't have one course of action. You have tremendous power in your hands. And I submit to you that when you get organized, when we get organized, when we develop programs and practices which are in the interest of civilized mankind the world over, you and I and this whole country will be the better off. And I'm proud to say that I am and have been a member of the NFO about since it was organized in my county. And I want to pay tribute to Warren Lee, to Chuck Fraser, Charming Ann Bornstein, to your department heads and others who, in whom you have entrusted leadership and positions of authority. It is much easier to criticize and condemn and complain. And we see lots of that coming to Washington. But over the nearly two years I've been in this job, I have never seen a time when Arne Lee came to Washington, but what he came with suggestions and ideas and advice stated in clear and unmistakably plain terms that no one can misunderstand. You have been well led and well represented, and I'm proud to be a member. In the last year, we tackled the job of overhauling the Farmers Home Administration. And many of you had had sad stories to tell about your experiences with the FHA. And because of the resourcefulness with which Arne Lee and Chuck Fraser presented your views, we now have the best credit program that's ever been written into law. Clearly understanding, of course, that credit is a very poor and distant second choice to income. And I could go down the list of things in which your national officers and I have cooperated in the last year and a half, presented to the Congress and to others in authority. I would, however, like to spend most of this evening responding to your questions. I'm sure you have many. Before we get into that part of the program, I'd like to tell you about a trip I just took. I've been in a place where they have no flies, they have no birds, no cats, no dogs. a place that's on about the same latitude as the United States, a place that has one-third as much cropland as we have in the United States, a place that feeds one-fifth of the world's population, 900 million people. That place is China. I was invited by the Chinese government to bring a team of professionals, experts, that's how they're known when they're away from home, to go to China at their invitation to talk about trade. 
we met with the top leadership in the People's Republic of China, talking about their plans to modernize their country. And they are a poor, developing country. And they've been around the world on a shopping trip. They've been exploring in the United States, in France, in Germany, and in Japan, and in many other places. And they told me in clear and unmistakable terms that of all the places they've been, nowhere have they found any agriculture that compares with ours. An agricultural system that they told me is the pattern that they would like to copy. An agricultural system that we have that sometimes is taken for granted. Sometimes even we who farm take this country and our system of family farming for granted. And so they've decided to modernize their country. They have 700 million people working in their fields. They want purebred livestock from us. They want canning factories. They want flour mills. They want bakeries. They want pesticide factories. They want farm equipment factories. They want to change their entire system to diversify their diet. And they want to buy one pound of chicken and one pound of pork per person per year in China is a hundred million bushels of feed. One pound. And they talked with me about the programs which have been developed in the United States in the last two years. And they were excited by what's going on here. They bought some wheat from us in the early part of the 1970s, and it was contaminated with smut. They stopped buying. Because they're not about to buy grain contaminated with a disease which they do not have. And so they were discussing with me the impact of the new strong Federal Grain Inspection Act. And I'm aware of the programs which have been developed within and by the NFO in providing customers with the quality of grain they bargained for. And there were two questions which they raised with me. One was quality controls, to be sure that the grain is not contaminated with sawdust and seashells or short weighed to be sure that if they put their hard-earned money into the grain markets of the United States that they're not going to get anything less nor anything more than they bargained to buy. They remember the anxieties and the devastation that occurred in Japan a few years ago when the United States unwisely embargoed the exports of grain for only a few days. They're not about to put their trust or their dependency on a country if its supplies are going to be on a hit and miss basis. They can't afford to start if it isn't going to be followed through and continued. And so they were asking me about the farmer-owned grain reserve, a program which is really not new, in a manner of speaking. Orrin Lee talked about the 
trials and tribulations of the Secretary of Agriculture, I've been reading about my predecessors. As far as I can tell, the first one was a guy named Joseph. He was the Secretary of Agriculture during the third Pharaoh administration in Egypt 3,300 years ago. And his adventures are recorded in many places, and among those places is the 41st chapter of Genesis in the Old Testament of the Holy Bible. in which even then they recognize that there are good times and there are bad times. There is good weather and there is bad weather. And they had the good sense to set aside the grain when they had good weather and draw on it when the weather was bad. And I'll never forget a little lecture I got by Oren Lee about a year and a half ago. And I know he has no, means no disrespect for economists. But he was in my office and we were talking about economic forecasting. And Orly said, you know, if you can't forecast well, you should forecast often. And I never forgot that. And it was about a year and a half ago, the economists in my department came to me and they wanted me to sign a document. Now it's about a year ago, it was in November, I guess. The document was supposed to forecast the corn crop for 1978. In November of 1977, they wanted me to do that. And I said, you gotta be kidding. I mean, you can't even forecast weather next Sunday in Washington, let alone what it will be like in Missouri in July. And out of that and other discussions, we set up the authority for this new program that you have taken seriously, that you have used extensively. As I told the Russians when I was there in June, I told the Chinese while I was there in November that we have the grain, but we have no intention of cutting prices to sell it just to get rid of our carryover. We've been through that. We have no intention of repeating the policies in 1972 that allowed the Russians to come here and buy 400 million bushels for $1.62. Not on your life. The people who buy grain from the United States will have to pay a fair price. Now then, the bargaining starts. But as a matter of fact, you know and I know that the weather has more to do with our crop in our country and in every place in the world almost than all these government programs laid end to end. And you know and I know that the corn crop next year will be somewhere between 5 billion and 7 billion bushels. Depending on whether we have weather like in 1974 or weather like 1978. And so there's no one can tell what the crop will be. We therefore don't expect a set-aside program to do anything more than be the blunt instrument to take land out of production and put it to a conserving use when we know beyond all shadow of a doubt that there is no need for that land to be cropped. This fence-to-fence -fence farming nonsense must come to a standstill. We have to apply We have to apply not only sound economic logic to our policy making, we have to apply sound conservation principles. And so we have announced a set-aside program for next year, a modest one, admittedly. We want about 15 million acres of 
ground taken out of production and put to conserving use. We want that ground which is more likely to erode, wash down or blow away, to be taken out of production because there's no need for that land to be cropped, certainly not in the next 12 months. But instead, we will use the farmer-owned grain reserve and continue with that program so that if we have a good year like we had in 1978 with an all-time record high 100 bushels of corn per acre, all-time record high soybean crop, one of the biggest wheat crops in history, that if we have another year like that, that the excess will not be forced on the market but the excess grain can be stored on your farm under your control to be managed under your farm power campaign. So the extra value of that crop will flow to you who worked so hard to produce it. Not to a foreign government or to an international grain gambler, but to you. And if we should be so unlucky as to have a poor crop in the United States, like 1974, instead of running the risk of embargoes and tearing the life out of the livestock industry, grains will be available for a fair price, of course. And all these were explained to the Chinese. We have now sold, this year, in the last few weeks, sold the Chinese 6.3 million tons of grain. And as long as our quality is good and as long as our supplies are dependable, they'll buy. And interestingly, in all the places I've been on trade and market development, no one has complained to me about price. Now, I know and we all realize that dealing in a world market as we are, we have to be aware of the realities. While we are responsible for 40 percent of the world's wheat exports, we're not the world's biggest wheat producer. And so we think the way to introduce some business-like dependability in these markets is to press for international commodity agreements, which set the, some limits. I have no intention of getting into a knockdown, drag-out treasury war with Canada, pitting their treasury and their grain growers against our own in a price war for the benefit of the Russians. It makes no sense. It makes no sense that grain growers in the United States should be the only ones to have a set-aside program. It makes no sense for us to finance the storage of the world's grain surpluses or reserves. Not when grain is a commodity which is exchanged freely in this world. It's a common commodity, a common currency, more common than the dollar, as a matter of fact, and more easily traded and sold, as a matter of fact. And so we're pressing for international, and we'll get, I'm now convinced, an international agreement on wheat which will establish some rules of the game so that rather than dumping wheat at disastrous prices, we, as a world, store that surplus crop and draw on it when needed. And you know the records on exports right, for this year broke all previous highs, 122 million tons. You and I used to think of exports in terms of someone else's misfortune. We'd say, well, if the Russians have a bad year or if the monsoons don't come in India or if something happens to Canada or if somebody else has a disaster, then we shall cash in. That kind of a policy meant that our 
Prosperity would be a sometime thing. We would alternate between boom and bust, as indeed has taken place mostly since 1970. Boom and bust. The all-time record high exports this year came at a time when the world produced the best crop in history. It has come because the world is at peace, no wars to tear things up, and because of this peace there has been a rising prosperity the world over. People have more money to spend. Now the Frenchmen and the Canadians and the British and the Japanese are eating about as well as they will. They make as much money on the average as we do in the United States. But China, Indonesia, Malaysia, India, Pakistan, and places that I sometimes are barely have heard of, those places in which three-quarters of the world's population lives are on the march, they're on the move, they're increasing their incomes, rising affluence. The first thing they want to do is eat better. And so we have tremendous market opportunities that won't come by accident, in which you, acting as responsible members, farmers, members of the NFO can find an opportunity, not only an economic opportunity for ourselves, but a chance to satisfy a demand in this world, more to eat, and in the process make a major and substantial contribution to increasing the prospects of peace, hopefully for all time. Now, we're not going to be able to sign a contract with China because we labor under the delusion that somehow they don't exist. Diplomacy is a strange, some say, science or art. We have no formal political ties with the People's Republic of China. It is my hope that we can soon establish such ties so that we can enter into more formal understandings with that, the largest country in this world. But in the meantime, it has been made clear by the Chinese to me and I can made to them our fervent hope and desire that we can exchange goods, that they will be buying from us. And this will open up opportunities like perhaps we've never really dreamed of. It's a slow, painstaking process. Progress comes hard, and it's a bumpy road, but it's worth the time and effort. And with that, I'm going to start answering the questions that you've sent up. If you have any more of them, just bring them up to the front. There's some folks around here in the side that will bring them up here. First is, what is the future of the country's beef industry? Some peculiar things are happening. You know, on Tuesday of this week, canner and cutter grade beef wholesaled for a dollar a hundred higher than choice. You know that this year, three quarters of the carcasses we slaughter will be good, prime, and choice grade, and half the beef we eat will be utility. We have become a nation of hamburger eaters. Everywhere, the golden arches. We're eating hamburger in our homes, and for lots of reasons, this is taking place. And we're not supplying that demand by a long shot. In fact, this year, beef production will be off one billion pounds below last year. 
Beef production next year will be a billion pounds below this year, according to the latest forecast. All of that shortfall will be picked up by an expansion in chickens, turkey, and pork, according to the reports which we get. There's an explosion in the poultry industry. Satisfying that strong consumer demand that is not being provided by the beef industry in the United States. Now, I know what the cow-calf operators and the livestock feeder folks have gone through in the last four years. It has been an unmitigated financial disaster. Heavy and sustained losses. The culling has been tremendous. We have seen 16 million head of cattle culled out of the beef herd in the United States in the last three years. There has never been a time in which we've seen such heavy culling. And of course, with that heavy culling, we found tremendous tonnage put in the marketplace and the prices went from bad to worse. And I submit now is the time to examine very carefully the prospects for the future which I happen to believe are very, very bright. But we're also going to have to look at this exploding hamburger demand, which we don't think is a temporary phenomena. We think it's probably for real and probably permanent. Chances are during the next six months that beef prices will continue to climb, probably into the low $60 range. Talking about live cattle, good prime choice grades. Chances are at the same time there will be about a billion pounds more non-beef meat produced and sold to pick up the slack. We already know from the increase in beef prices that has taken place since last November that there has been a reduction in beef consumption and an increase in the consumption of cheese and butter. Dairy prices are 50 cents over the support rate. I think the future is bright for the beef industry, but I think we who are involved in that business have to start thinking seriously about rebuilding our numbers. And my plea and my hope is that it's not overdone. We can't stand boom and bust in that business either. Not if the boom brings the bust. There needs to be some stabilizing at levels which enable producers to turn a profit. Next question, how will the USDA come out in the effort at government reorganization, will the department be weakened? About a year and a half ago, President Carter directed the creation of 20 study teams to look at this whole federal government. They found there are 1,200 functions in government which are duplicated. And that, of course, means waste of taxpayers' money, yours and mine. That means many times we have a bloated bureaucracy that is too overweight to be in good trim. I mean, I could name some. We in the Department of Agriculture, through the Forest Service, run a grassland leasing program. We lease lands to stockmen. Department of Interior, Bureau of Land Management has a grassland leasing program. Now there is no reason in the world that two departments should run the same program. There are five different departments have in this government that have to do with feeding programs. There are five or six departments and about 20 agencies that have to do with water policy. There is no water policy in the United States. It's a mess. 
because the Department of the Army doesn't talk to the Bureau of Land to the Depart Bureau of Reclamation, except in official meetings. And so we've not been able to forge a cohesive water policy for this country. So there is a need for streamlining, to cut the waste, to cut the inefficiency, to cut some of the bureaucratic nitpicking which goes on. Now the question that is before us at the moment is how far should this streamlining go? Should we, for example, abolish the Department of Commerce? Should the Forest Service be sent to the Department of Interior? Those and many basic and fundamental questions have not yet been really asked, let alone answered. The President has not had a chance to focus on the issue yet. Starting sometime in early January, various reorganizing plans will be prepared more formally, and on every case, any plan that will affect the Department of Agriculture in any way will be sent to me first, upon which I'll have a chance to make my recommendations to the President. And in almost every case, the reorganization plan will have to go to the Congress, where hearings are held, opinions taken, and votes recorded. I'm convinced that the Department of Agriculture will come out stronger, leaner, tougher, smarter, and more efficient for you, me, the taxpayers, and everybody else. Indeed, I'm convinced now that the entire federal government will come out stronger. Next question. There was a recent report that you were dissatisfied with the USDA study conclusion on the yellow sheet. What are your suggestions for proper changes to the yellow sheet? About a year ago, I directed the director of the Packer and Stockyards Division of the AMS to look into this entire matter of wholesale dressed beef pricing and marketing policies. I had heard reports of collusion and price fixing. In fact, there were convictions in federal courts in California and other places where persons were found guilty of conspiring to fix the price of beef, to take advantage of producers and consumers. And I heard many allegations regarding the manner in which beef is priced. And so we set out to find out precisely what is taking place. This group provided me with a preliminary report in early November, which, with which I was not satisfied because it was incomplete in some respects. And I asked the Packer and Stockyards Division to cooperate with our economic study group to provide answers to some additional questions. The report was filed on Wednesday afternoon this week. We have given Ben Stong and Chuck Fraser and Orrin Lee copies of this report, which will be discussed in detail, I presume, in a one of the issues of the reporter. But I would say this without taking up too much time, that I am very uneasy about the present price policies and the price reporting systems we have in this country. I'm not prepared and I do not charge anybody with any wrongdoing. But I submit when one or two percent of the transactions which take place in this country set the pace for the 98 percent of the business done in this country, we are vulnerable to manipulation.
We're going to hold hearings in several locations across the country after you've had a chance to digest our report. Hold the hearings and get your ideas as to how this price reporting arrangement can be improved upon. So we'll be out getting your suggestions. We won't have time tonight. We want you to give this matter careful and thoughtful study. We intend to present testimony to the Congress of the United States, perhaps in March of next year, with any recommended changes, if any, which may come out of the hearings, which we will hold. Next question. We've had a number of instances of government intervention in grain markets, embargoes, and so forth. Some inflation fighters are using us unfairly. What can you do to stop this? I think I've spoken to the question of intervention, the embargo matter, which was a disaster. And because our customers overseas weren't sure they could depend on us. And we've all had experience with embargoes. We have not forgotten what happened when some of the Middle Eastern countries cut off the supply of oil to the United States for a while, turned us inside out. Well, oil is important, but food is even more so. And I think that matter has been tended to. The President has said repeatedly there will be no embargoes, and there will be none. On the second part, inflation fighters using us unfairly. Not exactly sure what that might mean, but there's some things that really trouble me about all this business. In June of this year, for the first time in the history of the United States, consumers spent more money on the car than they did on eating. Tells you something about our values, doesn't it? Twenty percent of the disposable income in the United States was spent on the automobile, and only 19 percent spent on eating, both in the grocery store and in the restaurant. I just toss that in as an interesting comparison. In August of this year, for the first time in history, the wages and salaries paid to men and women who process and distribute food was greater than the farmer's share of the consumer food dollar. And that's a fact. And I'm not necessarily criticizing that fact. I'm simply pointing out that since 1973, three quarters of the retail food price increase is due to the added cost of convenience. And one fourth of the increase is a long overdue increase to the farm producers of this country. And what bothers me about all this is that whenever the Consumer Price Index is published, headlines in the Washington newspapers and other papers, food prices increase 1.8 percent. They don't bother to point out that three quarters of that increase is due to the cost of packaging and everything else that goes into this complicated industry. I've met with the grocery manufacturers of this country about that very question. Why, I said, is there such a tremendous increase in packaging? And it shows up in the grocery store as inflation, and the farmer gets it in the neck. How come? And they said, well, because consumers like to buy frozen pizza. They don't want to go home and mix it from scratch. Consumers like to buy groceries or vegetables in small cans, well advertised, it seems. Consumers like to have bread fresh, squeezed in the morning, baked at night by people paid wages for nighttime work. And the list of convenience which has gone on in this country is as long as your arm. 
Now, I can't stop a consumer who's prepared to pay the price of buying a frozen pizza or buying fresh bread or buying all of the processing that goes into the business these days. It's a free market. And I wouldn't try to stop them. But there are some things we intend to do. I have now changed the economic analyses group in our Department of Agriculture so that when that food price increases,